All right, good afternoon and welcome. I am Councilmember Costa Constantinidis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee. I want to thank uh, and recognize my colleague, uh, Peter Ku, also from Queens, who's here today and has a bill on the agenda. As this is the f committee's first hearing of the new session, it's good to be back as Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all the returning and new council members to the committee. I look forward to working with everyone over the next four years to make our city more green and more sustainable. I especially want to thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, for his leadership on the environment. I look forward to uh, four years of productive work and look forward to working with the administration as well on the big things that we need to get done to meet the 80 by 50 uh, mandate. <clears throat> our hearing today focuses on wind energy technology applications and legislation to enhance greater use of renewable wind energy particularly in urban areas. We will also hear legislation that requires implementation of energy efficiency measures. In 2014, we enacted Local Law 66 of 2014, which calls for an 80% reduction in citywide emissions by 2050, the 80 by 50 bill. To reduce our citywide emissions that dramatically, we must work aggressively to replace greenhouse gas emitting fossil fuels with a comprehensive combination of sources of renewable energy whenever possible. The five main sources of renewable energy are biomass, geothermal, hydropower, solar, and wind. Together, these renewable energy sources have grown to comprise 10% of the U.S. energy consumption as of 2016. The city has yet to, yet to include onshore wind power as part of its plan to meet its 80 by 50 targets. Wind energy projects are currently in the nascent, uh, nascent, nascent. nascent stage of development, but that does not mean that these projects are not a worthwhile adventure for the city. Several wind projects have already started in the city with enthusiasm for more. New small turbine technologies are emerging that could make residential wind power more feasible. Streamlining city regulations would make wind power more accessible and less arduous option for city residents and businesses. Also, the city could enact and implement a strategy to assess its capacity for onshore wind energy along our city's waterfronts in order to create more informed decision making on wind energy potential in the city's plan for renewable energy expansion. Wind technologies do not discharge any wastewater or produce any solid wastes while creating re electricity. Wind technologies also do not produce greenhouse gas emissions, as these technologies do not create any air, air pollution. There are substantial environmental benefits from employing wind technologies in New York City, where air equality has such a, a large impact on respiratory and cardiopulmonary disease. There is no way to achieve our aims of a good environmental quality and abundant energy for our lifestyles with continued fossil fuel use. The future of energy use in America is renewable energy, and this must include wind power. The American Wind Energy Association projects that if wind energy project installation increases by 3 gigawatts to 16 gigawatts per year, we could obtain 20% of our energy from wind by 2030. That, that kind of commitment to wind would result in 600,000 new jobs, reduce 825 million tons of carbon dioxide, and avoid $43 billion in indirect costs to society, like health-related illnesses or fatalities. To achieve these benefits, we will need to make changes and remove impediments. Uh, first, I want to thank and welcome back our council staff today, uh, Samara Swanson, our great uh, environmental protection uh, attorney. Thank you, Samara, for your great years of service. And Nadia Johnson, our policy analyst, looking forward to working with both of you uh, and the committee. And with that, I will turn it over to our uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Peter Koo, for an opening statement on his bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Constantinidis, for hosting today's uh, hearing. Uh, thank you for your leadership in terms of protecting our environment and protection of uh, uh, energy as, uh, sources. Uh, today, we are discussing Intro 96 in relation to allowing residential cooperatives 
to consolidate required energy efficiency requirements. In 2009, the city passed Local Law 87, which requires certain large buildings to audit their energy consumption and to submit energy efficiency reports. Those energy efficiency reports document any actions taken for the buildings uh, to come into compliance. As, uh, as we know, many re uh, residential cooperatives have multiple buildings on multiple tax lots. Under the current law, each tax lot has its own deadline which uh, with which it must submit its own report. This legislation will allow the energy efficiency reports of all tax lots within a development to be submitted together rather than in individually year after year. Not only would this ease the burden on residential co-ops which are taxed with performing these necessary audits and reports, but it will also present a more universal picture of the entire development's energy efficiency. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor McCoo. Uh, so before we hear the, from the administration, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We have a wind technology expert joining us via Skype from six hours ahead of us in Spain. Uh, please welcome uh, David Suriel from Vortex Bladeless. Mr. Suriel. Thank you very much for this nice opportunity to talk in front of you. New York is a city that I love, really. So <laughs> I'm, I'm in your city probably four or five times a year. Okay, I would like to share with you a presentation. Okay, here we go. Okay, can you stop it? We can see it. Okay, do you, do you see the screen? We do. Okay. Okay, I will explain you what is Vortex. Vortex is a technology that we are developing since 2012, 2013. And as a friend of mine that who lives in New Jersey told me that the great ideas require some patience, okay? So we are close to finish the development, but we don't have uh, a product to, to offer yet, okay? So I would like you to explain, uh, I would like to explain to you how this technology works to understand how wind power can work <coughs> in residential, in, in the roofs of a city like New York, and how we are different of the conventional wind turbines that every, everyone knows with three blades running very fast, okay. So what we are doing right now is what we call the solar panel of the wind power. What does it mean? You can use solar panel for a lot of applications, thinking in industrial applications that you need only one watt, or you can use solar panel also for a utility scale to power a plant of megawatts. With um, conventional wind turbines or wind power, it's normally used for utility scale and not for residential areas. You have small wind turbines, but they are not usual and they are not uh, machines that normally are used in urban or residential areas. What we are doing is the uh, pro uh, uh, a technology that will be used primarily for residential areas and industrial applications we can, because the first product that we are gonna launch, it will produce five watts only. And we will start to scale from this. But let me explain you very quick and very fast how is the principles of the technology. This is a Tacoma Narrows Bridge from Washington State in 1940. This is not an exaggeration, so this is mm, happening. So the wind force and some physical effects produces this movement and this oscillation at the end, the bridge fall down. My partner, David Yanez, the inventor of the technology, thought, okay, if this is happening to the bridge and also it's happening to many structures because the vortex shedding effect, the vortex shedding effect is the 
vortex that appears behind structures when the, the, the wind goes through that structure. Okay, if it happens, and also it's happening to the columns of the conventional wind turbines, why don't we think a different way to produce energy? Okay, and uh, so, and this, we have to talk here, not only with uh, vortex shedding, we have to talk also about the uh, resonant effect. So if an opera singer is singing and breaking the cup, it's because the tone of voice is in the same level as the resonant, the, the re so it produces a resonant effect in the cup, okay? But what happens if I change the tone of voice or I put wine in the cup, that we are not going to break this? This is the second principle that we are working on this prototype and this technology, sorry. Uh, Mr. Okay, Mr. Sorio, we're having your PowerPoint's yes. not coming across. It's uh, we see the screen, but it's not changing with your speech. Okay, it's not changing now. Oh, we still see just a vortex bladeless. We don't see the individual slides that are coming up. Okay, now it's starting to change. Okay, so you see now this. You see now this. Okay, but you're not going to see the videos. Okay. Yes, we should. Okay, uh huh. You don't see the videos now. Do you see the videos? I see the I, I see the, the four different parts of the screen. Yes, they're. Tell them we didn't see the common arrows. The common no, arrows we never right. saw. Okay, let me. So if you see like this, it's okay. 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 Let me explain. You know. Okay, through the years that we have been working, since 2013, 14, 15, 16. We have been working in three different technical milestones. The first one is the geometry. The geometry is really important because when you have uh, wind, you have to harvest the energy from the wind. And it, direct, it depends directly of the geometry. So we start to develop different geometries. Okay, that one, that one, that one. So this is, those are prototypes that we have in testing, only the, the geometry. Also that one, and this is a prototype that we produce some energy. We have everything here, okay? And this is the last one. So at the, at the end of, it was in 2017, we got this geometry, we patent, we made a patent over this geometry. And this, is, this was the first technical milestone. The second technical milestone, it's related with the resonance effect. If the wind changes, Normally, in a wind turbine, it, they produce energy, okay? Because they don't have a resonance effect. But as we have resonance effect, if the wind changes, we need to change the natural frequency of oscillation. It means that when the wind starts to move our mast that is around three meters per second, that's a normal wind in a residential area, we start to oscillate. And we are keeping oscillating until nine meters per second right now. That means that if you are in New York, the wind average in New York probably is around six meters per second, five, six meters per second. So we produce energy. And if the wind changes to nine meters per second, we keep moving and oscillating and producing energy. And the third technical milestone that is the, the goal that we are trying to achieve right now is to produce enough energy with the alternator that we are producing to say that the technology is feasible, okay? And we hope to achieve this goal along 2018. And I think you have a presentation that I sent to Samara and where I, we say that mm -hmm. if we are in 2018, we will be in the market between 2019, 2020, okay? Those pictures are prototypes that we are using right now in the field test. They are really small. Our goal is to produce from three to five watts. It doesn't, it's not really a good power to, for a New York City. This, is, this only works for industrial applications and it's not a big amount of energy. But the next, mm, the next, uh, so the first product, real product that we want to launch will be 100 watts. That is similar to a small uh, solar panel. So if in New York you put a solar panel on the roof, you have a solar panel, like in this picture, let me show you. 
you have a solar panel on the roof and you have a vortex, you, pr you are producing energy from two different sources, sun and wind. So during the night, you have more wind than during the day. The advantage of this technology is that we don't make any noise, okay, because we don't have any gear or moving part in contact, so it's absolutely silent. We don't have, as we don't have gears, we don't need to change any oil and the maintenance goes almost to zero. And the cost of the levelized cost of energy, that is how much cost to produce energy with a device like this, it will be close or below of a solar panel. Okay, the applications are not only for homes, are, all, are also for, as I said, uh, industrial applications like street lights or things like that. Now we are producing, as I said, around the line, the blue line is the vortex. We are around two watts, okay, with one alternator. We put two rows of magnets and two alternator, alternators in the same device. So we think we are close to produce the five watts we are looking for. And well, I think, well, this is the team, this is our, our advisory board, and we have been in contact for, from many companies and many universities around the world. And well, if you have questions, please. So this, so this technology, you're looking for the 100 watts application sometime this later on this year, correct? Yes, but as a, as a industrial, no, I'm sorry, as a pre-commercial, okay? Right. The 100 watts, we will have the first prototypes for testing uh, at the end of this year. 2019 is going to be the year to industrialize and start producing more units to go to market. And I understand that to go to United States, the regulation is strong as is in many countries. So we will need to work on that kind of regulations in every country before we think we can offer this to the market. All right, so you'd have to look at not only New York City regulations, but federal and state regulations as well. Well, as you know, we are in Spain, and the regulations in the United States, you have federal regulations, you have uh, city regulations, and. We have to, to, to study a little bit more about the regulations in the United States because we are more focused now developing the technology than uh, thinking in the regulations. So, we're, but, but this is setting the stage for wind power that's not the traditional, you know, almost looks like a, a, a blade. This, this, this is bladeless. We're looking at an entirely new type of technology coming down the pike in the next five years for wind. Absolutely, and uh, talking about the regulations for a new technology, as you can think, it's not, I think, it's not going to be easy because when you go to regulations, they are talking about three blades, and they are talking about existing technologies, and this is a non-existing technology. So, yeah, along the next period of five years, we think this is going to be solved. All right, Mr. Suriel, thank you. So I, I can't take questions from the crowd. I'm sorry, Catherine. So uh, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation. And I look forward, if, when you do come to New York City, to sitting down with you and, and discussing how we can uh, move forward. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So. With that, I'll call uh, the administration uh, to the table for their testimony, please. Eric, how are you, sir? We are joined by uh, Councilmember Rafael Espinal uh, from Brooklyn. We're also uh, joined by Councilmember Eric Ulrich from Queens. So, Samara will swear you in. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear for him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? All right. If we can just introduce yourselves and then go from there, that'd be great. Good afternoon, Chair Constantinidis and members of the committee. I am John Lee, 
Deputy Director for Buildings and Energy Efficiency at the New York City Mayor's Office of Sustainability. And I am a registered architect in the state of New York. I am joined today on my far left by Alan Price, Director of the Office of Technical Certification and Research at the New York City Department of Buildings, or DOB. And to my immediate left, Anthony Fiore, Deputy Commissioner of Energy Management at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the following bills. Introduction 48 in relation to the creation of wind maps demonstrating wind energy generation potential within the city. Introduction 50 to amend the New York City Noise Control Code, the Administrative Code of the City of New York and the New York City Building Code in relation to small wind turbines. Introduction 598 in relation to green energy to amend the Administrative Code of the City of New York to require that all city-owned buildings be powered by green energy sources by 2050, and introduction 96 to amend the administrative code of the New City of New York in relation to allowing residential cooperatives to consolidate required energy efficiency reports. Climate change is perhaps the toughest challenge New York City will face in the coming decades. The global dependence on fossil fuels and the unprecedented scale of greenhouse gas emissions or GHG emissions have led to increasing temperatures and precipitation, rising sea levels, and more frequent and intense flooding that threaten our communities, health, and economies. While President Trump continues to abdicate American leadership on climate change, we here in New York City are hastening our shift towards clean energy by taking direct action to reduce fossil fuels and GHG emissions. For example, in May 2017, Mayor de Blasio signed Executive Order Number 26 committing New York City to the principles of the Paris Climate Agreement, directing city agencies to align our work with the agreement's goals to limit gl global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. In January of this year, the mayor and our comptroller announced the city would be taking the fight straight to the fossil fuel industry by seeking damages for the investments necessary to protect New Yorkers from the impacts of climate change and divesting our pension funds from fossil fuel reserves. The leadership on climate change from our city council has also been admirable, setting the pace for cities across the world. For instance, the buildings mandate introduced by the council last year are a bold and necessary step to not only dramatically cut GHGs to help hold global temperature increases to just 1.5 degrees Celsius, but will also support the livelihoods of our residents by spurring thousands of green jobs. We are grateful for your partnership in our collective effort to fight climate change and look forward to working with you to pass the mandates this year. Today's introductory bills align with the administration's climate goals and so we are pleased to testify in general support of them. In order to meet our goal of 80% greenhouse gas reduction by 2050 or 80 by 50, we must make a significant shift to cleaner electricity production. Today, only about 6% of the electricity feeding New York City's grid is generated from renewable sources such as wind, solar, and hydro. So we have to continue to harness the power of the sun and the winds at the level of the utilities and on the roofs of our homes and workplaces. To reach our clean energy targets, the city has set an ambitious target of 1,000 megawatts solar power citywide by 2030. Wind turbines also have a role to play in this strategy as we have to take every opportunity to displace fossil fuel energy. With respect to introduction 48, the bill requires the city to periodically conduct a wind resource assessment. Given the drop in prices for solar photovoltaics and the more favorable power production capacity of solar photovoltaics as compared to small wind turbines, most of the recent clean energy opportunities on roo rooftops have favored solar projects. However, not every site is ideal for solar power production, and opportunities to extract pow wind power at small scale have already been proven. With limited space in dense urban areas like New York City, this bill will help us identify and map areas with high potential for certain types of wind building-mounted wind turbines. When mounted on the rooftops of our homes and businesses, the noise and vibration nuisances from wind turbines are particularly challenging to control from an engineering perspective. Introduction 50 establishes acoustic performance and safety standards for building mounted small wind turbines. We strongly support the codification of standards related to building mounted wind turbines. In 2011, 
The Department of City Planning and the City Council revised the zoning resolution to clarify the land use requirements for rooftop mounted wind turbines. Furthermore, in 2011, the Department of Buildings published a Buildings Bulletin that provides guidance to the industry and a reference standard IEC 6100 to ensure the safe installation of small wind turbines. The guidelines include procedures for attorney, obtaining approvals and permits for building mounted wind turbines as, as, as administered by the Department's Office of Technical Certification and Research. The standards proposed by Introduction 50 differ from those already published in the Buildings Bulletin, but these differences are minor and could certainly be reconciled. The Administration and the Department of Buildings look forward to working with the City Council to resolve the technical standards and ultimately codify these very important regulations that will ensure the safe installation of clean energy production. With regard to Introduction 598, requiring that city-owned buildings be powered by green energy sources by 2050, we agree with the spirit of this bill. It is important to set targets that are bold and visionary. For example, where the city has direct control over energy supply, it has already begun to take action. The city will have installed 39.14 megawatts of solar panels on city assets by the end of 2019, enough to power 131,269 homes. In addition, the city has been actively assessing and installing other alternate clean energy technologies, including fuel cells, battery storage systems, building integrated photovoltaics, wind, geothermal, and solar thermal systems. The administration looks forward to working with council on the details of this proposal and sketching out the path to achieving the ultimate aim of these bills and the broader suite of climate change mitigation interventions the administration and council are progressing. Finally, we support Introduction 96's efforts to streamline the submission process of energy efficiency reports. There are a few technical edits that we will offer in order to ensure that DOB can properly enforce for compliance. In conclusion, please allow me to applaud the council's leadership on combating the impacts of climate change to New York City. Working together, we are confident that we can strengthen these bills to help us achieve our 80 by 50 goals and uphold our part to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I'm happy and my colleagues to answer any questions that you may have at this time. I thank you, John, for your testimony and I too value the work that we've done together. Uh, you know, this committee has uh, in the last year passed 16 bills. So I look forward to continuing that and continuing our partnership to uh, make our city greener and more sustainable. Likewise, Chair. So that said, let's talk a little bit about wind. <laughs> There's so many jokes there of me being elected official, but, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll refrain. Um, how does the city assess uh, onshore wind potential in NYC? Largely, it is a uh, site-specific assessment. Um, the, the kinds of uh, resources that are proposed by uh, Introduction uh, 48 are exact kind of immediate resources needed to make uh, the short-term feasibility analyses um, to understand the efficacy on any given site. Ultimately, though, it will come down to a site-specific analysis, and that is generally how it is conducted today. Have we ever looked at different waterfronts to see what the potential for wind power generation are so far, this is one thing we really haven't, it's more site specific, like you said, which one brings it to the table more than us looking for it. Uh, this certainly does bring it t to the table more than we have looked at, at it in the past. All right, um, how many wind, utility scale wind turbine permits have been granted by the department building in, buildings in the last year? Uh, I will defer this question to Alan Price from the Department of Buildings. Uh, actually, there have been no uh, utility scale installations that have been approved by the Department of Buildings. We have approved one uh, large mast uh, mounted wind turbine that could approach uh, utility scale size, but that was not for a utility. Not for utility. How many residential scale permits have been granted? Uh, we do not capture that information on that granular of a level. However, anecdotally, we are aware of about seven installations, small wind turbine installations that have, that are currently uh, operating. So they're currently going, it's not per year, it's like seven total. Yes. Okay. Um, how many are currently, applications are currently in, in the process? Uh, 
the uh, applicants are not required to indicate on their applications if a wind turbine is being installed. Uh, uh, at least that information that we, we cannot capture uh, the way these applications are filled out currently. Okay. Um, so how do we, when it comes to solar, uh, for solar they do? Uh, for solar, yes. Okay. Um, I know that we have our new sort of subset of the, of the Department of Buildings coming forth. Uh, the, uh, the, the not, I'm trying to think of the, the term. I'm a Office of Alternative Energy. Yes, yes. Uh, how would we make sure that uh, wind, I know it's on, the tip, it's on the tip of my tongue. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> how would we ensure that uh, those applying for wind turbines would be able to sort of get help through that uh, now subset of DOB? if we're not requiring them to sort of click that they're a wind turbine project? Well, currently, the, uh, any wind turbine that is uh, being proposed for installation uh, is an as-of-right product. It can be used as long as the wind turbine meets the established criteria that we have published in our buildings bulletin. That criteria is clearly published in, in the bulletin. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the main hurdle there is that the uh, equipment must be listed to a standard that we have decided meets all of our safety concerns. If a wind turbine uh, can meet uh, not only the listing, but a few other requirements that we have in the bulletin, such as maintenance, inspection, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that wind turbine may be uh, used in the city of New York. Uh, of course, as with any installation, uh, it has to be approved and permitted at the Department of Buildings. How long do the permits take on average? For our first review, uh, a view and evaluation, three days. We're okay. mandated to complete our uh, first review and evaluation within three business days. Okay, and how about uh, you know, start to finish? How long does it usually take to sort of, from the time someone puts forth their application to the time they're able to get all of their permits and get working, how long does that take usually? Yeah. So uh, part of that is up to the applicant. Uh, that first review will identify many of the objections that we have, including outstanding information. As long as the applicant can get that information back to us in a timely manner, we'll be able to approve as quickly as possible. So we're looking to make this as easy as we can, right? Because uh, I know right now, I mean, I think I've said this about a thousand times already, so I'm sorry you have to hear it again. Um, but when someone wants to do traditional uh, you know, fossil fuel-based projects, we, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. They know the standard, they go get a boiler, they get their permits, they put it in. For alternative energy, we want to try to make it that simple, right? So people aren't looking, weighing out time and money. And is it any more expensive or any more complicated to get any of these alternative uh, renewable energy projects done than a traditional project? Well, looking at a wind turbine installation compared to other alternative energy installations, uh, this is uh, perhaps the, the quickest uh, process that we have in place for approval of, a, of an installation. Uh, I, I'm not aware of anything that we could remove from the process to make it quicker. This is extremely uh, streamlined at the moment. Okay. How many wind projects in New York City have received grants from NYSERDA for a small wind turbine program? Unfortunately, I'm yeah, not. I don't think we are in a position to answer on behalf of NYSERDA. We can certainly inquire with our colleagues there and return to you with a written response. All right. Well, um, you guys have any questions? I'll ask one. Eric. All right, Rafael, I'm going to pass it over to Councilor Espinal for a few questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'm, I'm new to this committee, so I'm, I have a lot to learn and catch up on. Uh, but uh, one of my major interests is renewable energy and especially how homeowners can go about installing some of, some of this technology into their homes. So what, what would be, uh, I guess, the, the basic steps someone who lives in a normal brick townhouse uh, would have to go through in order to get a wind, small wind turbine installed into their rooftop? Uh, the first step uh, would be to contact a uh, registered engineer, a uh, registered architect or a professional engineer for the installation. Uh, they would consult uh, with the professional uh, for their needs. Uh, after that, the professional would evaluate uh, different systems that would be available on the market today uh, and compare that to the requirements that we have published in our bulletin. Uh, those requirements, again, they do re center on safety of the equipment. Of course, anything that's installed in New York, we want, the, want it to be as safe as possible to protect not only the residents, but also neighboring uh, uh, residents as well, neighboring structures as well. 
so uh, that comparison is made uh, against our bulletin. If the product uh, that is selected, that's being considered, meets the established criteria, uh, then the registered design professional can uh, accept the product and specify it for use on a project. They will then file with the Department of Buildings. Uh, that is the uh, process that I was uh, just outlining previously. Mm -hmm. uh, once they submit to us, uh, the turnaround time for our first review and evaluation is a three-day period. If everything's in place, uh, it can be approved and then uh, the application can be permitted at that time. Is, is there any difference between a residential building and a commercial uh, multi unit dwelling uh, building owner? We do not make the distinction in our bulletin mm -hmm. on residential or commercial. We do make a distinction on size. Uh, the bulletin covers small wind turbines. Okay. okay. They are typically installed in residential, but. Right. Well, are, uh, have you seen? I mean, um, are, I know one of the bills, are, um, it's in regards to noise, right? Uh, have you received any 31 complaints from neighbors about? the sound that these, some, some of these turbines are creating in the neighborhoods? I, I am not aware of any uh, complaints on noise. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Sure. All right, well, considering you, you've shown support for all four bills, I, I know when to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I look forward to working uh, with you all and the administration to get these bills passed and working with our speaker as well, so thank you. Thank Good you, Chair, morning. thank you, Committee. All right, so let me do it better then. All right, oh, that's it. So we have, next one we have a, a someone from Skype again, uh, CGE Energy, uh, Paul Schneider from Michigan. Mr. Schneider, are you there? So I guess we'll come back to Mr. Schneider uh, in a few minutes. Um, so you next wanna, up. You wanna, we can do, a, we have a couple of people here who are wind um, turbines right now. Um, and uh, one more. Do we have uh, David D Brownstein? Daniel Farb. Yeah. Daniel Farb, please come forward. <laughs> William. Vakina. Vakina. Tashina. Vakina. Yep. Mm -hmm. Please uh, step forward. And uh, where's David Brums Brumstein? And, uh, um, he's, uh, he's in San Francisco later. Oh, Michael Waite. Michael Waite. Uh, I just emailed him. He did not. Uh, he was not okay. here as yet. All right. Uh, Eric Weiberg as well. Eric, are you here? If you can step forward as well and, and testify. Mr. Farb, if you can take your seat, just because we need to keep things moving. Thank you. All right, wonderful. I guess we can start uh, with you, Mr. Farb, and then work our way over. All right. Turn on 
on your mic, please. Just press the button right there. The red button. Like that? Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, so my name's Daniel Farb, and I'm going to talk to you about how we've made the first wind power solution for dense urban environments. Now, uh, I'm sorry to have to talk a little bit about myself, but I think it's important because there are over 200 small wind turbine types in the world, and a lot of them are nutty. And uh, I want to sh show you that when I'm talking, I'm talking uh, with a real scientific background. Um, now, some things just about me. I set a record at Yale University. I also have degrees in medicine and business. I have 30 patents in the area of renewable energy. Um, for the last number of years, I was mostly living in Israel before I came back to New York. And in that time, uh, the wind turbines I'm talking about um, won the distinction of being considered among the top 45 inventions in Israel's history by the Bloomfield Science Museum. Uh, got the Urgea label for technological excellence. And uh, uh, also were the first wind turbines connected to the grid. And um, there are a number of other things you can read later. But what I want to tell you about is how it all started in New York. And we're all from New York here, right? So we all know what the center of the universe. So I'm going to show you. When I was a kid growing up in Riverside Drive, and then you just read the uh, OK. When I was a kid uh, growing up in Riverside Drive, I would sometimes uh, play with as, as the wind came whipping from the Hudson River up Riverside Drive. And while I was waiting for the bus, I would spread out my coat like this and try to catch the wind. And one of the things that struck me as very funny is that there were certain places along the block where the wind gave out and certain places where it was stronger. And that is the basis of the field called computational fluid dynamics, which is the basis of what I've done in terms of wind. Basically, very simply, it's taking the flow of air, of water, and figuring out how different obstacles in its path or different structures influence the way it flows. So that's what's really um, going to be special about what, what I'm doing. And I've been looking for ways in which to um, Jacinda, this isn't moving ahead. Just a second. It's not moving. There we go. OK. So there are problems with traditional turbines, as we've all heard. Uh, they can be very big. There's noise and vibration. Uh, the key thing I'm going to focus on today is how the density causes turbulence. Uh, when you look at the big wind farms, you'll see that the turbines are separated by five blade diameters from each other. And the reason is, is that their turbulence interferes with each other. And they also have a minimum starting speed of three meters per second, which is 6.7 miles per hour. Now, uh, what I've done with my company, Flower Turbines, we've made small ones. They're quiet. They're less uh, noisy than the wind itself. The key thing is the density actually improves turbine performance and by 20 to 50 percent. And this is going to be key for how to make this work in New York. And also, they start at 1.2 meters per second, which is half of everybody else's. So uh, let's learn a little bit about different types of wind turbines. On the top left, you see a horizontal axis wind turbine. It's based on lift principles. It's too noisy to use in an urban environment. Next down, you see lift type of vertical axis wind turbines, also too noisy for an urban environment. And at the bottom, you see drag. Now, drag is the least efficient. However, because of the low noise and other factors, it can be used in an urban environment. So what we've done is we've taken the drag concept We've done some things to it, as you see from our uh, turbine there, um, as I'm going to show you in a second, that have changed the efficiency. And the key thing is that by making them in such a way that they can actually help each other perform better, we've made it possible to make large wind farms on a rooftop and to change the economics. 
So this is an example of how it would look. Okay, so there are three sources of turbulence. And excuse me for going through the science, but I think it's important because the science is important here. We, we and believe I think in science here. What? We believe in science here. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so there are three sources of turbulence. One is the turbine itself can cause turbulence. Number two is turbine to turbine. And number three is building to turbine. So I have a patent that addresses each of these issues. Let's go through it. Number one is that we break up areas of turbulence uh, according to a specific formula by placing dividers on the trailing edge. That's patent number one already granted in the United States and a number of other places. Number two, and this is what's really crucial, is you see on the left how the turbulence reduces efficiency when you put the lift types of turbines next to each other. We have a specific formula whereas our, whereby our turbines are creating wind tunnels into their neighbors. And you'll see it actually results in a higher velocity wind than the turbine itself receives. You see on the next picture here, you'll see the arrow is pointing to an area of red. Well, the wind is coming in at a yellow speed, which is lower than red, and as it hits the turbine, the turbine is absorbing the energy that comes to it, but it's also deflecting off energy to the side so that there's actually higher velocity wind than there was before it hit the, t the first turbine. And when you place the second turbine and a third turbine on each side, each one of those benefits from it. So that's the most important part of the science. Um, we've done some testing of it, and you'll see that as you move the shaft away from the adjacent turbine, there's a spike in the power. That, this one shows almost 50% increase in power just when you take this technology. So what we've done is basically take drag ver vertical axis turbines and move them into the efficiency level of lift turbines, but without sacrificing the quiet and the low vibration. Now, I'd like to ask everybody in the audience, what do you see that's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with it is you have a turbine here, a turbine there, but the solar is all together. Solar is cost effective because you can put them all together. Although how cost effective it is in New York is another question. But in general, it becomes more cost effective <coughs> because you can put them all together. But here, you have turbines for show and not for dough. So the idea is that when you can put them all together, it's a cheaper installation and they feed off of each other. Okay. So the third problem with turbulence, the turbulence is that buildings, the long vertical side of a building uh, creates turbulence and vortices that can interfere with how rooftop turbines work. So by using different types of aerodynamic tricks, we can get the wind to be higher velocity and less disturbed by the currents coming up from below. So that's patent number three. Okay, so you put it all together. We did calculations of how you would compare wind with solar. Here I took Cape Cod, which is very similar to New York. Uh, in the northeast, there's very little sun, relatively speaking, and if you're near the coasts, you have a relatively good wind resource. So if you'll see, uh, in Cape Cod, where the cost of energy is 16 cents per kilowatt hour, which is even lower than it is in New York City, wind very slightly, our wind, very slightly beats out solar in terms of payback time. However, the big thing is that it's 80% it's better in terms of money per square foot or of energy per square foot. In other words, it's a much better investment for a northern type of climate when you have the sea breeze available. So this makes a very big difference in a dense urban environment like New York City. And here I've just compared, uh, you can look in more detail later, some of the more important things about the different criteria that you need in order to make small wind work. It has to be zonable. It has to look appealing. It has to be cost effective. And the whole thing of going and getting a permit from the people at the Department of Buildings for just one turbine isn't as cost effective as getting a permit for 20 at the same time. And that's why we're concentrating on the cluster effect and everything that that means in terms of cost effectiveness. Now, even though I've said some things that 
could be a little bit negative about solar in New York. I want to explain that I actually believe it's important. It's an important part of the product mix. And that's why I put on this next slide. In coastal areas, your peak power is most closely balanced by wind, but even better by wind plus solar put together. Peak power, for those of you who don't know, is the problem that your worst consumption or highest consumption of energy occurs in the middle of August in late afternoon when everyone turns on their air conditioners. And that's usually when you get brownouts and blackouts because of that. That means that your renewable energy's biggest value is going to be to calm down that uh, peak at that time. So if you look at this, this is uh, a theoretical uh, uh, installation, but it shows you the principle of how wind and to some extent also solar take care of that, that those peaks in the afternoon and why it can be very helpful even if you can't make the whole city have renewable energy. These two put together in the right proportion and the right places can make an impact on something as serious as having a blackout. Okay. So what are the issues for New York? Well, there's a high cost of energy. There's pollution and wellness. There's vulnerability to breakdown in the power supplies we saw with Hurricane Sandy. And um, you need regulate, there are regulations that make it necessary to produce energy locally. So I'd like to bring attention now to one of the issues that's not just electricity. It's water heating. Um, some of you may be aware that there's a huge housing stock in New York that's using carbon sources. And if you're using diesel fuel, the cost of, the the cost of making that into electricity, instead of the 20 cents you pay Con Ed, is more like 40 to 50 percent for diesel fuel. And if you look at this uh, over here, it's hard to see it, but the blue, blue is for buildings. And that is showing the numbers of the noxious gases that are produced in our environment from the water heating from buildings in New York City. And you see it's some, in some cases more than 50%. So one of the things that we can do is making a cluster of these small turbines. We may not be able to power the building, but we can definitely address the issue of hot water by connecting them to pipes. And instead of feeding the energy into the grid, we feed the energy into the hot water system and decrease the amount that the boilers need to work. And this would be very cost effective um, uh, to do. And here I've just put up, uh, I went through the numbers on water heating economics. Wind and solar over a 20-year period come out, as you see in the big blue line at the bottom, uh, come out to be more cost effective per dollar um, than the oil and, and even gas. Because even though it's cheaper to uh, buy the gas burner, the oil burner at front, over time when you include the costs of the <coughs> fuel, and solar and wind do not need the fuel to keep going, the cost, it's a much better long-term investment. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'd like to do. I would love this to be a market for me. And what I would like to do is do one project of 10 in an area of good wind and low buildings. So we start off where it's a little safer. We're not worried about something flying off the top of the Empire State Building or something like that, right? Uh, but a flat roof of a large building, we've got plenty, everything from JFK through Marine Park in Brooklyn, uh, the west side uh, near the Hudson River, uh, as I mentioned. I'd like to have a pilot project here. Uh, now, also I'd like a pilot for smaller ones, for homes, because the cluster effect can apply just as well if we're making smaller ones for residential uh, use, except that each turbine produces less energy uh, and when we make them smaller, they fit in very well with solar systems uh, as well. So you can have a combined wind and solar on many of the buildings that you see in Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. And then three, um, a pilot for rooftop hot water demonstration on a, an apartment building. Uh, there are tons of them, for example, in the Bronx and uh, you know other places where um, 
you have lar large apartment buildings, big flat roofs, and where we can do this kind of thing. Now, one of the things I'd like to talk about um, in general is my, my feeling is that when we start getting too many regulations, sometimes we start making the costs go up and the difficulty of implement implementation uh, go up. As Costa mentioned, um, it should be as easy to get renewable energy as for the other things, but it's not. And um, I wanted to go through some of the different uh, regulations that are needed and then some of the specific ones that are in uh, uh, the write-up that I got about the um, – and, and really talk about what regulations are most needed and what aren't. So there are a couple of regulations. It has to be easy and cost-effective. There should be some kind of automatic permitting level. So, for example, and I admit that it's in my interest to say this, but it's scientifically true – that in general drag turbines are not going to have a noise problem. So why make a regulation about noise problem for them? Say that for drag turbines, this type of turbine, you don't have to go through steps A, B, and C. Um, so another thing is you don't want to add uh, renewable energy to the tax assessments. Also, there are different um, – and interesting financing plans. Now, there's a PACE program. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of PACE programs, which are mostly implemented. I don't think they're available in New York State yet, but it's something to shoot for. Uh, something, but we're, we're something we're looking at, yeah. Yeah, but mm -hmm. it's, very, it's a very useful program. It brings down the cost of renewable energy and of not just renewable energy, but energy upgrades in other ways as well. Um, so other things might be making city buildings more easily available to offer opportunities to get started. Maybe there's some ways in which there can be bank loan guarantees. Maybe you can work with the Green Bank of New York, which was, I think, a great idea. Uh, I think safety criteria are very important in New York because of the skyscrapers, because if something um, you know, goes off, it's really, really seriously dangerous. But I think the safety should be clear. They should be reasonable and uh, they should be adjusted to the height of the building. Uh, there should be piloting sites available. And again, I'm speaking my own interest. It would be nice if uh, we encouraged New York firms like my own uh, that maybe we should get a little bit of an extra benefit because we're going to be doing our uh, corporation or corporate jobs and our financing and everything in New York City. Uh, so I have some specific comments on the proposed uh, regulations. When you're talking about uh, noise, you need to specify the number of decibels at a certain wind speed. That was done later on, but in that particular paragraph it, it doesn't because it's dependent on wind speed because the number of decibels go up as the wind speed goes up. Um, I think the definition of 100 kilowatts is very high. Nobody's going to put 100 kilowatts, a single turbine, on a building. Which leads me to a point I'd like to make. There's a difference between putting things on buildings and putting things on isolated areas and, uh, and parks. So there may be some areas in Staten Island where you could put a utility-sized turbine without it interfering with somebody. But there's no way that you could do that in Manhattan, for sure. So you may want to make looser regulations for those areas where you can put in more like utility-sized turbines and you can take advantage of their higher efficiency in that case versus um, uh, the ones that you put in more urban areas where you have to place noise and vibration at uh, a premium. Uh, I, another thing about I, the regulation on brakes and locks, uh, I was saying why not say a lock and a brake and keep it simple instead of specifying how many. The, what we count about is that we count on is what works, not necessarily how many uh, we specify. Uh, another regulation, y you'll look at the specifics later if you want, and I'm glad to talk about them in more uh, details. Now, why exclude artificial lighting? Maybe it's good for it to be used to arti for artificial lighting. That way it doesn't have to go into the grid. You can you increase the off-grid uh, uses. Now, about the visual appearance, uh, you say it can't be brown, but what if, you, what if you're going to then put something white on a brown building? There's so many brown buildings along around New York. So I would say to leave it open, and it even leaves it open for something that I'm interested in doing, which is echo art, 
which is using the beautiful tulip design and making it different colors so that you can have people enjoy the different colors of it. It can be like a work of art, kinetic art, actually, uh, in the city. Uh, I think that in another one of the regulations, uh, instead of uh, making locks and things like that, maybe fencing off would be adequate. Uh, with drag turbines, there's no issue of shadow flicker, so why not leave it only for those types of turbines where shadow flicker is an issue? Uh, th there, there are a number of thing, other things that I can go through in more detail. I don't want to really bother everybody with all the details about this. But uh, I think in general, in, in waterfronts, uh, because there were some questions whether or not they should keep it out of waterfronts, is that uh, the drag type, which is not going to be a safety issue um, and won't interfere with the public's ability to enjoy the areas, maybe it shouldn't be excluded from waterfronts. And the waterfront is very often the best area because you're right next to the sea. Mm -hmm. So um, let's think about how to handle that in a different way. So I'm very glad to handle questions. Thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you to William for remembering that from our conversation in the hall at Stony Brook University, uh, this led to it. So thank you very much, everybody. And thank you to Samara for arranging it. Thank you, Mr. Farb. So I'm, 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 we're going to take everyone's testimony first, and then we'll ask questions afterwards. Okay. We're joined by Kalman Yeager, council member from Brooklyn as well. Go ahead, William. Um, Mr. Constantinides, it's uh, Eric Weber. I have no um, presentation, but um, William has said that I'm, it's okay with him if I go. Just, that's right. fine. We, not everyone needs a presentation. It's right. okay. Thank you. My name is uh, Captain Eric Weber. A uh, brief introduction, I represent McAllister Towing. Uh, it is a family-owned private uh, business in New York City at the Battery. Uh, we uh, have been in business for 150 years, uh, fifth, fifth going on sixth uh, generation. We own and operate about 70 vessels uh, from Puerto Rico to Maine. Uh, my background is I'm a master mariner. Uh, I've uh, been licensed with the U.S. Coast Guard as a captain since 1995. I've operated over 100 vessels in, in many countries, mostly uh, tankers, also yachts. Um, I have a degree in law and also in marine affairs, which is marine policy and environment. And it's not too often you get tanker captains that are versed in uh, the environmental uh, policy as well. Um, we are very interested in the offshore wind sector uh, because um, we feel that it is a great driver to sort of revitalize New York Harbor. Uh, we, uh, as a business, have seen um, New York Harbor decline. It's not even on any top 20 list of world ports on any uh, metric. Um, it is a choke point almost. People are bypassing it. Uh, yes, uh, Bayonne Bridge has been raised, and yes, uh, there have been improvements, um, but I don't think anyone believes it's going to uh, change uh, the trend of declining arrivals at ships, which is how you measure traffic and uh, volume of cargo. Um, and what that means is while ships will continue to serve this major market, um, they will um, <coughs> not be able to access the, the markets deeper into the continent through New York. They'll choose other uh, ports to do that. So offshore wind uh, is a great opportunity uh, for folks that have developed this technology and this skill set and have the money, billions, you know, 50 billion is being bandied around uh, to invest in the United States. The United States has uh, granted access um, to these firms, uh, enabling them uh, to move forward. As we all know, uh, the vessel, tra vessel traffic uh, separation uh, scheme approaching New York, which is basically a highway, um, a lot of it has been allocated to Statoil, the National Oil Company of Norway. Um, when the opportunity arises, they will invest in uh, you know, building uh, wind turbines there. Also, uh, South Fork at the eastern end of Long Island. What's interesting is that uh, the wind does not have to be harvested in the state in which it is landed. So that uh, opens up a whole um, world of political and practical opportunities, including the continental shelf, you know, which is federal. So I won't go into that kind of uh, detail, um, but uh, it's a very, very promising time 
money has been spent, uh, investment has been made, licenses have been given, uh, so it is no longer abstract. It is coming, and we would like to be at the front of it. Because it's offshore, um, there is a major maritime component. And in Europe, when industry says to the government, support us by building a port, the government does that. In America, it's less easy. Uh, they're more likely to be a series of smaller platforms enabling um, these investors to um, build their um, wind farms and also to support them because there's normally like a 20 year uh, you know, uh, maintenance program where you've got to have a constant flow of personnel back and forth. It's a very hostile environment. We all know uh, nor'easters, hurricane, hurricane storms, blizzards, um, and they've still got to be maintained. So, um, so you're going to need the personnel uh, with the skill set to go out there. Those have to be U.S. licensed mariner mariners. Um, you're going to need U.S. built vessels, which means a higher cost per vessel than almost any other country in the world as a result of the Jones Act. Um, uh, one of our tugs is, say, over 15 million, shall we say, in the U.S. to build. In China, a uh, tug of equal quality is 5 million, 6 million. So, um, so those are challenges that Europeans are going to want to surmount. So um, how does that affect us? Um, we, uh, again, on the larger picture, uh, New York, there, there are very few alternatives to New York Harbor. It's 25 square miles. It's really the best equipped. It's, 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 it's our opportunity to, uh, to, to make the best use of. And, um, and there, there won't be another for a while. On the larger picture, uh, if we fail, we don't have the vessels to do this ourselves. There is no U.S. vessel that exists or can exist in time for this wind to arrive. If we do not impress the Europeans that we are capable of building what they require, they will not build it here. They will go to China. And whether they come back or not uh, is for someone else to answer. And whether we'll develop the skill set or not in time to do it ourselves is, is, is another. Um, there's no question the United States has a capability to build uh, landside uh, wind turbines. It's just there's a disconnect at the present time between you know, that skill set and the offshore skill set. Um, so it's really a challenging and a really fascinating um, uh, you know, uh, position. And um, what's interesting we find is that not all um, firms that operate in New York Harbor are uh, New York firms. Uh, because of the nature of the maritime business, um, you know, we are, are uh, lodged very uh, permanently uh, here in the city. So we're, we're looking forward to embracing, you know, any infrastructural improvements and uh, contributing to it any way we can. We've got 700 or so people um, and 70 vessels. So um, uh, we're learning as we go, um, but we'd like to be part of the discussion. And we really, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be welcome today and, and to uh, speak and to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Weiberg. Yes, hi, yeah, uh, Jimmy. Ahead. Thanks, thanks for uh, having me. I just have a few brief words. Um, really, this project was I uh, was more of a facilitator, uh, connecting some resources to the committee uh, early on, um, and uh, just want to add to the discussion as a practitioner of energy modeling. Um, uh, two bullet points there that are obviously difficult to read. My name is Will Bikina. Um company is Energy Wall. We are um, essentially energy modeling and mechanical systems design um, for the full suite of re renewable um, you know, capability in terms of modeling solar, uh, geothermal, um, and to a le lesser extent, wind technology. Um, we use several different um, tools in that effort. Um, Autodesk uh, is a is a company which produces um, extensive software in the energy modeling area. Uh, one piece of software is called Revit uh, MEP. Um, <clears throat> the Department of Energy uh, has created an extensive suite of technologies um, wrapped up in something that's called Energy Plus, um, and that um, does <clears throat> full building simulation. Um, and wind, solar, geothermal can be modeled within that tool. <clears throat> we also use MATLAB for sort of custom uh, modeling efforts. Um, <clears throat> and the NREL, uh, the National Re Renewable Energy Lab, 
uh, has created uh, a very sophisticated tool called SAM, which some of you uh, I'm sure are familiar with, uh, which uh, uh, models solar and wind technologies as well as economic um, economic aspects in terms of funding and uh, overall project costs. So these are the, some of the things that um, we do um, for projects, um, both you know high end residential as well as commercial, um, and, and some uh, grid scale applications as well. Revit in particular is a is a three D modeling uh, based system, so we, we create a, a building model <coughs> in 3D, and that can have all the mechanical systems. Here we see uh, some rooftop systems, um, which might be you know typical for uh, HVAC and, and uh, HVAC-related analysis. <coughs> this is a uh, project we did um, recently overlooking um, Central Park for an energy recovery system. Um, which also is probably, you know, would not be particularly applicable for, for wind in that location, but um, some of our clients do have access to, to rooftops and, and uh, in other areas would be um, interested in, in learning more about what wind can do for their particular application. Just an example of another 3D model of a building with uh, mechanical systems, and this could be used to... Um, communicate visually the uh, impact of uh, turbines and also uh, further into uh, fluid mechanical uh, modeling as well. Um, under the hood, so to speak, um, in these tools is something called TMY data, typical meteorological year data, which is been assembled um, over many years. Uh, NREL and the Department of Energy maintain this data and it basically gives you um, typical wind conditions for every hour uh, of a given year. So you can make predictions as to um, the potential for wind and solar um, as well as um, environment, um, atmospheric conditions for <coughs> full energy modeling of a, of a building and how it's exposed to different conditions throughout the year. Um, and as well, the NREL SAM um, systems application model, I believe is the acronym, is a, an extensive piece of software which is highly valuable for economic and energy modeling for solar and wind. This is uh, just an example of uh, what's called a wind rose, which gives uh, wind predictions for a given location in terms of the wind direction <coughs> and intensity. And then that same data uh, for every, uh, for the, uh, throughout the calendar year in terms of uh, monthly, monthly data. So just an example of the type of data that's available and I'm sure uh, other experts have uh, access to similar so that's all I wanted to communicate to the uh, to the board today. Thank you very much. I want to recognize we're joined both by Councilmember Steve Levin from Brooklyn as well as Councilmember Donovan Richards from Queens. I'm going to ask a few general questions of the panel, and then my colleagues, if they'd like, if they have any questions, I'm happy to let them chime in as well. Uh, what do you do? You support greater utilization of onshore wind uh, technologies while offshore wind use and distri uh, distribution matures. Can I say something about sure. that? Sure. Um, I'd like to say something that I really, li um, I really like what uh, my neighbor on the left has been saying because I've spent some time in Europe and I've visited some of the factories uh, that are making wind in Europe. And it really is a crying shame that in America we're way behind. And it's a huge industry. It's one of the industries of the future to go offshore. Mm -hmm. And this is a great opportunity with New York Port and all of the area around Long Island and off the uh, New Jersey coast as well. Why couldn't it be? The, why couldn't the supply chain be set up here, which is really the well? I would hope the most most known port in the area. Um, so I think that of course on offshore is going to take a long time, and it's not going to be enough to satisfy 
the appetite alone. And you're st even though the actual production of offshore wind can be very cheap, when you include all the transmission costs, you end up, um, so you're still going to pay 20 cents a kilowatt hour when it actually gets to you. So um, that's one of the reasons why you need to develop both onshore and offshore at the same time. And what's the greatest impediment that you see for us to, what are we getting wrong here in New York City that we can do better? Uh, well, I, I think that, um, uh, I'm not sure if it's anything wrong. It's like most of the, the country, uh, you know, what I'm talking about is a new technology and a lot of people have looked at vertical axis rooftop wind and says it doesn't work so well. And they're right. Again, imagine if you took solar panels, you could only put one solar panel on this end of the roof and one on the other end of the roof, who would be using solar panels? So I'm really the first one that's made that possible for wind, where not only can you put them close together, but they make each other perform better. When the, so it really changes the way that you look at things. So the thing that would help me the most in terms of this uh, aspect would be having low cost ability to get zoning and to get projects and even a little uh, lending help or something like that in order to get these projects moving ahead would be the thing that would help me the most. And so that's what I'd say. And for offshore, uh, you have to build a supply chain. There's no easy way around it. But it may, I mean, you may want to specify that uh, New York com companies get first choice, but uh, un unfortunately, we've all fallen behind Europe in that sense, and we really need to make a serious, concerted effort of putting together a supply chain. If it's any help, one of my other technologies is in an organization in San Diego, uh, or belongs to an organization located in San Diego called the Maritime Alliance, and it's uh, associated with the Commerce Department, and maybe I could put you in touch or other people who are interested in developing the maritime industries um, uh, in the New York area uh, with the director of that alliance and it, uh, partially funded by the U.S. Department of Commerce. Thank you very much. Uh, just one thing I would add is in terms of um, you know, predictability in terms of uh, for practitioners to be able to predict uh, energy output um, is something that I've been investigating um, and adding to that tool set, um, you know, I'd be looking to you know, coordinate with Daniel to see how his models can be, um, uh, can be targeted at more specific locations. Um, so that's one thing I can see is, is going to be required is, is, is better modeling for specific applications uh, that will facilitate, you know, folks like us that are trying to uh, implement these systems. I definitely appreciate your comments on the bill, Mr. Farb. Uh, I look forward to working with all of you. Uh, uh, Captain Weber. Uh, thank you. Just briefly, um, our focus is Long Island. I mean, it's kind of an interesting situation because they are political borders with Connecticut, mm -hmm. where Connecticut will try to harvest wind, but they can't plant the turbines in its contested <laughs> waters, so to say. So, <laughs> so you know, uh, it, we look offshore to harvest the wind and then inshore to, for the supply chain, the infrastructure. But Lo Long Island you know, is, is ta facing challenges. It's, it's, um, it's got the choke point of GW Bridge you know, to get equipment and, and cargo out to it. It's got a growing population. Um, it can produce a lot of its own products that it can then um, you know, uh, export. So, so we're looking at Long Island and, and getting, um, getting things rolling and overcoming what, what will doubtlessly be uh, many logistical and other or hurdles, but, um, but we believe it, it can be done with a, a great outcome. All right, great. I appreciate all your testimony today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to attempt again to uh, Skype in Paul Schneider from CGE Energy in Michigan. Hello. 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 Hello, Mr. Schneider. Hi, can you hear us? We can't oh, see yeah. you. We can't see you, but we can sort of hear you. All right, let me let me move the camera closer. No. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, now, I, now I can see you, just not hear you so well. Oh. All right. <laughs> hey. 
Let me see the mic volume here. All right, now we hear you. Oh. All right. Oh. All right. Good? All right, you're ready to go, Mr. Schneider. Let, let, uh, okay. Ready for your testimony. Well, thank you, council members. Um, thank you for the invitation. We appreciate the opportunity to talk about small wind. I'm actually, he's out of frame now since I moved the, the computer closer, but I'm joined here with uh, my chairman, um, Gary Westerholm. We see him. And, all right, and then actually off screen, I have Brian Zaplitney. He's our president and CEO. Uh, hello. Ryan, how are you? Good. <laughs> I'm going to sit back down, but there's not room for all of us at this little camera, but thanks for having us. Welcome to New York. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, <laughs> as far as what your guys' objectives are, um, going back to your, your overall goal for 80% reduction in your greenhouse gases by 2050, and then your interim um, the 40% by 2030. We think that small wind has a big role in, to play into that. And we believe small wind is very economical and feasible without as far as upfront costs to the uh, possible businesses or residents that may be um, getting the supply from it. But and then we have some other models that we'll speak towards as well. So we have a, uh, a presentation to uh, that we'll walk you through. Do you want me to just jump right into that? Jump right in. All right. Let me share my screen. All right. So do you see a kind of blue background and it says Windy 20 on it? Yes, I do. Very good. So that is up and working. So we will, uh, we will start. All right. So Windy 20 is our uh, proprietary wind turbine, and we consider it the most innovative wind turbine out there. When we looked at the technology that was existing, there was a lot of uh, either barriers that made adoption hard or just issues in general that need to be addressed. So when it came to innovation, we looked at technological innovation. So this is the turbine and how it works itself. And then financial innovation. So this is those cost barriers that may prohibit it. And then community innovations. How can a turbine technology, aside from the sustainability aspect, how can it add value and be an integral part of the community? So, so we will dive into each of these areas in this presentation. But I guess first, let's take just a step back as far as the, the history of the turbine. Windy 20, that 20 in its name, that stands for this, the 20th iteration of the uh, technology that we're uh, in development of. So we, we, we go back to a few uh, successful prototypes. So actually, Gary uh, Westerholm, he, uh, he was very involved in those. So I will let him talk towards those just for a brief moment. All right, thanks. Uh, basically, on the left side of your screen is the first prototype that we put together. That was back in 2004, and that was in northern Quebec. Uh, that proved the technology, the design, and that was part of a, if you go to the next slide, it was part of a work in progress. We were working with uh, Silverstein Properties and Skidmore Owens and Merrill to put uh, this type of wind turbine on top of what was called then Freedom Tower. And that vetting lasted an entire year of 2004. And at the end of 2004, uh, we were told we were their choice. And unfortunately, a, a month later, the building design got changed and we didn't fit. But we were vetted ex extremely well by all the people that, uh, that were involved with this project, from uh, SOM to any number of other organizations that took us through us. JVB, I mean, there was... Uh, there was a meeting every other week for eight months getting vetted for this particular project. And uh, we were their choice. A tribute to engineering was that uh, this technology beat out GE. Yes, it which, beat out everybody else. Which was, was pretty uh, substantial in itself, uh, and a great accomplishment. Um, let, let me step in a little bit, go back to that first slide. If, if you look at uh, that, that first prototype and you see all the the guy wires and, and the struts and so forth. Um, 
the, the goal here was to take a vertical access machine, which typically is, is built and, and mounted on the ground, um, and to take that and lift it into the air. Now, if you look at that, that slide to the right, that picture to the right, you see the, the shape of the blade and, and that machine. That, that uh, tower is 150 foot tall. That blade cage is uh, 86 foot across. And if you look at that blade, it's like the shape of a, a spaghetti noodle, if you will. In that tropiscine shape, the center of that blade is where the energy is produced. And the, the, one of the benefits of a vertical access machine is that in an urban environment in the city or in an urban environment, it's um, very quiet. The decibel level is about 40. It's uh, compared to falling leaves. And that machine will take uh, wind shear, wind gust. In, in, a, in a city environment, you get a tunneling effect because of the buildings. So it's very conducive to, the, to its environment. Our goal was to be able to lift that cage into the air. It's never been done before and prove through this process that this could be done in, in a very close proximity to the building, as you can see, and it's safe. Uh, we accomplished that. Currently, we have um, four patents, excuse me, three patents uh, approved and, and five additional pending uh, on the technology. We implemented uh, features for life safety and, and, and uh, safety situations within a environment where people are going to be near and in proximity to the, the wind turbine. And looking at uh, all the competitive products in the wind market, just to give you a, a mind's eye picture, this wind turbine is 105 foot tall. It is very uh, similar to about the size, a little smaller than a water tower. And um, it fits within the community very well. It's above the tree line, but it's not a disruptive, uh, as far as appearance, and a disruptive uh, machine that is going to make noise. You get that wishing sound from the horizontal machines that everybody complains about, and then shadowing and, and uh, flicker and so forth that you hear about in, in the news all the time. And, and that creates the not in my backyard um, complaints that uh, we're all familiar with. The, in the design, our goal was that because of construction times and, and periods was to solve these problems that everybody else seems to be having. So we constructed a, a, a footing, which we call a green footing. It's, it's produced within a factory. It's a precast uh, situation that comes in pieces. It's shipped out on a flatbed truck. And a standard backhoe can dig this 20 by 20 hole. Um, when we assemble and put that footing together, then a flatbed truck with a loading rig for the wind turbine comes out to site. Like the kids' uh, TV uh, movie or, or the uh, Transformers, the machine actually walks off that flat, flatbed truck. Hydraulically, it moves to the site in the footing and sets itself up. We have, of course, to, we have to torque bolts to a certain specification and make electrical connections. But as it stands itself up, it goes into a programming and hydraulic mode where it positions itself. And as you can see in the corresponding slides, it opens up. That blade section is designed that way. Um, go back to where the blade's opening up. That blade section is designed that way um, because of hurricanes, tornadoes, storms in general. The machine is connected to the national weather uh, stations. And in the event of uh, high velocity winds and uh, possibly debris flying, the machine can shut itself down, protect itself by collapsing the blades to the mast. And after a storm, it will reorientate uh, as far as understanding what's happening with the weather and then redeploy. And during that period of time when everybody's down, uh, there's an energy storage component in the base of the, the turbine. So we're producing power, storing it, and we're able to be up and going for life, life safety reasons. 
um, go to the air brakes there. We, we designed a system very similar to a um, an airplane wing there, where you see the trim flaps in the center of the blade where we're producing the power. Our goal was instead of uh, using a, a braking system to control the, the wind turbine was to design a, a air brake style system similar to an airplane wing where we can brake and hold the speed of the turbine at its maximum peak to produce power at any given time, which is 80 RPM. So during a storm when it, everybody else needs to shut down or protect themselves, we can operate up until it gets dangerous um, by utilizing air brakes, which is not friction braking uh, in a sense of like a disc brake or, or how the traditional wind turbines um, handle their, their control. There, there's no noise. Um, the effect of the sphere, if you will, of, of the turbine, um, we re received a combination through prototyping through the Audubon Society because the birds actually see it as a tree and they fly around it. And because of the speed of the blade, they actually were able to navigate and fly through it without being hit. And that was uh, uh, quite a uh, accomplishment. Uh, we felt that that would happen, but when we witnessed it and the Audubon Society witnessed it, they gave us a, a letter stating that, uh, that we're, uh, we're bird safe, and that was a, a nice uh, feature. Um, the, the, that blade structure is made up of uh, 11 sections of blade, um, and it, they bend at the joint very similar to your elbow, but then they lock in position while they're producing power. The machine, in the event that it needs any work or maintenance done to it, has many features similar to the automotive industry. It was built on an automotive platform where we can lower it to the ground uh, very easily in, uh, for maintenance purposes. So nobody has to climb the tower or no crane is needed. And then in addition to that, um, depending on the environment, the utility, we can change the size of the turbine as far as power it produces to, to meet the needs of the facility or the environment uh, conducive to the, uh, the utility. So the machine currently, what we, what we state is a 20, 50, and 65 kilowatt, but with recent uh, improvements to the size of generators, um, now we can go up to 100 kilowatt and still fit that into our cartridge and compartment. Everything is in a modular uh, aspect as far as the wind turbine. Um, if, if there is any repair, if a generator goes out or a control system goes out, they're all on roller bearing system approaches, very similar if you were to think of your computer, if it loses a hard drive, you swap the hard drive out. The machine, the wind turbine machine is set up the same way. We're at the base is where the generator and the control system is versus in the air like the traditional wind turbines. And we can swap that out in the same day. If we have failure, we send it in for warranty. And I just want to note here while we're back on this slide that 65 kW, which is the nameplate on kind of a standard model, that produces about 100,000 kilowatt hours annually. Um, so it is more for a a larger energy user for like a business, a nonprofit, a government school. facility, a school. Um, it, Cause that's about 100,000 kilowatt hours is about 10 times the average residential user. So while I know in your long-term plans, you've talked about community solar, that kind of thing, we could work with the utility to develop like a community wind to where this could power residential homes as well. But, um, it does produce significant power, so it traditionally is at those larger user sites. So to, to go a step further with the, with the wind turbine is that it was designed for distributed on-site generation. So if you think about what we're trying to accomplish here is that we need a small footprint on the property, the given plat of that uh, parcel um, to produce power for. but in our industry, 
there is no silver bullet. So we couple the wind turbine with many different technologies, and that's what we call our sustain model, our sustain program. So to, to look at a, a, a broader stroke here of what you're trying to accomplish, and I think this will be helpful to your, your panel, um, is that the, I'll look, bring it up a slide here. Yeah, it's a little I'll start there. Okay. That the the sustain model does not have an upfront cost. We invest into the uh, the community where if it meets the criteria, the, the sustain model meets the criteria, and the energy savings that we can capture uh, is is beneficial for the client uh, as well as the financial investment, and then of course CGE as well. All three parties need to win. We'll invest and in, in, in put a sustained model in place. Now, it could be a combination of uh, solar, the wind turbine, combined heat and power, efficiencies of many kinds. And just as an example, uh, uh, an existing client, uh, a large insurance company, we're, we're handling a project for their headquarters uh, currently, and we're able to reduce their carbon footprint emissions um, 55 percent and the uh, the impact to that to their utility usage as well as the impact to the environment it, it's substantial and and our goal was to have the the turbine as a uh, a center you know um, I guess like a center a focal point or, or brain of the entire system, and it is. Um, it does many other things other than just being a wind turbine. Um, with the uh, the recent uh, uh, shooting, school shootings that uh, that everybody's aware of, uh, we've worked life safety features into the turbine and tracking, connecting to Homeland Security, uh, reaching out to the... Uh, the uh, local fire and, and, and police departments. And I can't talk more about that. There's things that we're doing to patent and, and, and so forth. But uh, the emergency response, the, the machine is truly a first responder um, prior to the, the police. And, and uh, these are areas that are very close to all of our hearts. So we've taken it serious uh, with our partner, Roush, Roush Industries, to uh, implement these technologies into the, the machine. So to, to recap and just go through the business model, um, it, financially, it, it's very important to, to show the client the benefit. And we do what we call a, a mutual success agreement. And um, we sit down and define, if you really, a, a, a quick description of that would be to really to go to the last chapter of a book and, and uh, find the conclusion and then work to the beginning to make sure that you meet the objective to get to that conclusion. So in that mutual success agreement, we're gonna look at the existing utility expenses, gas, water, electric, and, and how power is being consumed and produced and used on site. Once we identify all those needs, then we write an agreement with the client um, utilizing the different technologies to meet that goal. And once we've meet, met those objectives under the sustained model, then we, we bring the financial investment in and, and so that uh, it will fund and fuel the project for the given period of time. Now, what's most Im important in this is that that there's no capital cost to the existing client. And in many cases, they are either breaking even with no expense or in a positive cash flow from day one. And that insurance company, as an example, they're extremely profitable from the first day without a capital investment. And then they're meeting their internal objectives and goals is like what you're looking for. Um, they're, uh, impact to the environment and then their you know social responsibility side of improving what they're doing in the environment and to the community so all those things come into play and then more importantly the way i see it more importantly is that 
it's a focal point within the community. If there is a crisis or situation that that all that information and life safety is is there to be handled through that community aspect of the wind turbine, and it connects to all the important features um, necessary to report to the police and and uh, like I say, homeland security and and uh, fire department and so on. So those are things that we're working on very uh, closely to make sure that. Uh, we can make a difference. Our motto for the company is that we have the power to make a difference and, and we're using that uh, that catch line or phrase to, to really show that we're doing what we're speaking and uh, educating and, and helping in the, in the community. All right, Mr. Schneider. I really appreciate your uh, testimony today. Thank you for Skyping in to, uh, from Michigan, you and your entire yeah. team there. And uh, we're definitely appreciative of your efforts and, and uh, look forward to working with you. Thank you. Likewise. Now, um, actually, Brian, did you want to speak towards their, uh, their small wind mapping at all? I, yeah, I did. Okay, they, great. There's, there's a, if I could just add one more thing. I, I, sure. I read this. Um, this bill they're putting forward. Um, so the traditional horizontal machine and the way wind is wind is mapped, um, the height that it's done at and so forth, and you, you address this here in this um, piece of literature that Paul's provided me. And the vertical access machine is in how it utilizes the, the wind tech technology is different than a horizontal machine. Uh, a vertical machine does not have a problem with wind gust or a wind directional change. It works very well in an urban environment, in a, in a municipal or, or, or a, a inner city environment. Uh, we're going to get a tunneling effect and so forth. But how the utilities and, and how wind has been measured in the past is, is actually wrong for this type of technology. We've done our own testing and... Um, our machine at a uh, low class three or a high class two produces substantial power. And I think it's important that that with that, that tunneling effect that I'm talking about between the buildings, that that's taken in, uh, advantage of. And that's why it was looked at so closely with the Freedom Tower, because those wind shears and gusts and patterns change dramatically and it doesn't affect this type of technology, but actually in a positive way. Exactly. And so uh, that's what they, we, they were studying. You know, uh, um, they, they built a beautiful tower there, but unfortunately they, they steered away from the technology that we had uh, designed and put in place. But through the vetting process, we did win that opportunity. So that's uh, a little credit to our, our engineering. So. Um, we, uh, we shared our information about that wind breaking because we couldn't patent that feature being that an airplane wing utilizes that technology with the Department of Energy and uh, they are currently pursuing it with some of the biggest players in the world, the Vestas and GEs and so on. And uh, we feel that we have quite a, a solution compared to anybody else in the world of what we bring to the table with our machine and more importantly, the systems approach, because there is no silver bullet. And I want to keep making that point. There is no silver bullet. It's going to take all the technologies to accomplish the commitment that you've made. And thank you. All right. Council members, anything else from, from us as far as the testimony? Uh, I think we, we definitely appreciate your time. Thank you for Skyping in today. Likewise. Take care. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to call forth the next panel. Uh, Bob Wyman, uh, Lisa De DiCaprio, DiCaprio uh, Roland Lewis. Is anyone here from the Waterfront Alliance still? Ryan Chavez from Uprose and Paula Spear.
Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so. Sure, go ahead. Here. All right, so. Yes. I guess we'll start there on the end and work our way across. Bob. Bob Wyman. Okay. What's your testimony, sir? No. Oh. <laughs> thank sure. you. Sure. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much and commend you guys for uh, working on wind. I, I think it's been pointed out that there hasn't been enough done on wind in the city so far. Um, <laughs> Uh, a specific comment on the, the bills as they're proposed, and then I'd like to talk about a general issue, and particularly the interaction of wind with beneficial electrification, um, um, electric vehicles and heat pumps. The specific comment is that um, I think it's, it's wise to have siting restrictions for wind in the city, but I would like to encourage you to make one exception um, of a very specific location in the city, and frankly, uh, that, that's because as we have the smaller, quieter, safer uh, uh, wind turbines being developed, I think it would be really great to think about putting wind turbines in Times Square, um, if nothing else, as a demonstration and as a very visible sort of uh, a symbol of how the city is committed to these goals. I think on that plaza, say in front of the TKTS booth or some, somewhere down low on a 30 or 40 foot pole, um, one of these small, quiet uh, wind turbines would, I think, be a great contribution to the city. It will also probably end up being the most photographed wind turbine in the, in the world, uh, <laughs> just because of the nature of the people going through there. Um, so I would like to suggest that that modification be made to the siting restrictions. Um, also, I'd like to talk about the importance of, 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 of wind, particularly as relates to beneficial electrification. And first of all, uh, point out something that I've seen a lot of times uh, when people are talking about the importance of renewable uh, electricity, they seem to be focused on the question of, oh, given how much electricity we have today that's being generated and used with fossil fuels, how do we replace that with renewal, renewable um, uh, electricity? I'd like to point out that that's not actually the goal. Because um, as um, organizations like uh, recently, there was a report by, from the Brattle Group uh, in, in January 2017, who essentially said that in the process of moving towards beneficial electrification, that's the electrification of transportation and heating, electric vehicles and heat pumps, by 2050, if we're to meet our carbon goals, we're going to need about twice as much electricity as we have today. Not less electricity, not the same amount, but just turned in, uh, made, made from renewable sources, um, but rather uh, even with all the projections for what we can do with efficiency in the use of, in the existing uses of electricity, if we are to replace um, the tremendous amount of fossil fuels that we use for, for heating uh, in furnaces and in uh, automobiles and other transportation applications, we're going to need twice as much electricity as we have today. Um, and so, that, of course, uh, raises the importance of anything we can do to, to increase uh, uh, the generation of electricity. Now, I'd like to point out that um, uh, wind is a particularly important elect um, uh, source of electricity if you um, are looking at uh, things like heat pumps. And the reason for it is, is that wind uh, power production happens typically at night and during the winter. Um, when, uh, frankly, the, the need for, when, when the traditional requirement for electricity goes down, uh, but the need for electricity in things like heat pumps goes up. Also, one of the curious things about wind is that as, wind, uh, as the wind picks up and it blows uh, harder, you essentially are cooling off your buildings and, and your requirement for heat increases. So one of the nice things about wind is that as the wind blows harder, um, it provides electricity explicitly f when the heat pumps and such need them the most. Um, if you could, I'm sorry, not everybody has this, but if you could look at the piece of paper that I've given you there, um, just to show you, I'd like to talk about some of the, uh, uh, the, the actual impacts of using wind in combination with heat pumps. And what you see here is a chart that shows you 
for a given kilowatt hour of either additional consumption or additional production of electricity, what is the impact on emissions? On the bottom, on the x-axis, you see the, the grid emissions in terms of grams, uh, grams per kilowatt hour. And you'll see that New York City is highlighted there. There are a couple other sample areas in, this, in, the, in the country showing their grid emissions on that, on that uh, x-axis. On the, on the right axis, you'll see the emissions impact um, of either an increase or a decrease of production. Now, the interesting uh, thing to look at here is first that horizontal line that sort of bisects this, this rectangle. That essentially shows you for, for solar, for wind, for efficiency, how much you save in emissions given a particular, uh, for every kilowatt hour, given a particular um, emissions factor for your local grid. The unfortunate thing about these technologies is as the grid is already, when, as the, at any particular point um, uh, in, in terms of efficiency uh, of the grid or cleanliness of the grid, as you add more clean production, it turns out that you get less and less benefit as your, get, as your grid gets cleaner and cleaner. And eventually, it's trivially obvious if the grid was 100% clean and you added some, some additional uh, production, you wouldn't be reducing the, uh, 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 the, the emissions from your grid at all. You'd be having more electricity, but you, but you're, you wouldn't be reducing the emissions. When you have something like heat pumps, you have an, an exactly the opposite effect going on. And those are the lines you see going from, from sort of the down from the upper left down to the right. And the idea here is that as, as you make the grid cleaner, the benefit from having clean electricity and using it in something like heat pumps goes up to where its, its maximum benefit is when, in fact, um, uh, the electricity you're using um, is, is 100% is 100% clean. We can see on this chart already, if you were to say look at, a, look at say, the line for the COP here of 3.5 uh, on, the, on the New York side, you'll see that actually New York City's electricity is already so clean that in fact um, an additional kilowatt hour of electricity consumed in a heat pump gives you a greater carbon uh, savings than an additional kilowatt hour of, of electricity produced with a solar panel or even a wind panel, okay? The, uh, however, that is not in any way uh, intended to discourage the use of solar or wind. The wonderful thing here about solar or wind is because they are essentially, we can think of it as for marginal electricity, they would have zero emissions, okay? That means we can go all the way over on the, on, on the left-hand side here, and we'll see, for instance, that in New York City, when we replace uh, oil furnaces with heat pumps that are powered by um, um, uh, solar or wind or other clean technologies, we are e essentially reducing by over a thousand grams, okay, um, our emissions for every kilowatt hour we consume, okay? That's almost, almost two pounds of emissions for every kilowatt hour um, by, by using the clean electricity in a heat pump application, okay? And that's a much greater, much greater use than if you were to simply use that clean electricity for the things that we already use electricity for today. So um, um, one, one final point on that, and I don't know, Samara, if you were successful in getting Professor Modi to, to come today, but uh, Columbia has recently done studies where they look at the economic viability of, of heat pumps uh, within the city. Um, and what they found is, is because of that match between the production curve of the wind technology and the consumption curve of heat pumps, typically wind and, and heat pumps both either consuming or producing at night and during the winter, okay, what that means is that the economically viable quantity of wind dramatically increases. Traditionally, we've had a problem with wind in many parts of the country in that if you uh, that often you need to curtail your wind resource because you end up producing too much power at night or during the winter when people don't need it. Um, however, if we increase our consumption of electricity through beneficial electrification at night and during the winter, that means that it's possible for, uh, for the people who deploy wind uh, generation resources to deploy more of those resources economically. And frankly, what that does is it gives you free electricity during the, uh, uh, during the peak.
peak periods um, uh, when otherwise, uh, um, uh, otherwise the production from wind would be lower. So I'd like to uh, very much encourage you to continue in uh, continue encouraging uh, and, and uh, uh, wind production and, and creating the environment within which it can be uh, deployed in a uh, in an organized and, uh, uh, and, and and rational fashion and also to look closely at uh, trying to encourage synergy between the wind strategy and the the geothermal and the heat strategy uh, as well also, just that one thing, and that is please consider uh, whatever exceptions are necessary to make it possible for us to consider uh, wind in Times Square, where, where it will really be a showcase for the world. I definitely appreciate that. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, my name is Ryan Chavez, and I am infrastructure coordinator at Uprose. We are a social and environmental justice uh, organization based in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, uh, as well as being um, members of the leadership of the National uh, Climate Justice Movement. Um, I'd like to devote my time this afternoon speaking, speaking strictly to Resolution 176. Um, we applaud the governor's commitment to the development of large-scale offshore wind projects by 2030 um, and this committee's resolution to support this goal. As you know, New York City's most vulnerable communities were disproportionately affected by Superstorm Sandy. These same communities, like Sunset Park, where we're based, have also been overburdened by the fossil fuel economy. Many of these same communities have previously been homes to active blue-collar industries and manufacturing. But today, communities like Sunset Park face significant displacement threats as industrial land is being repositioned for upscale commercial development. Offshore wind can deliver power directly to New York City, displacing the need for the dirty pl power plants that have overburdened communities like Sunset Park for generations. But just as importantly, it can provide an opportunity to position the city at the center of this emerging industry, driving local economic development. And when we refer to local economic development, we are really talking about leveraging the industrial waterfront properties in communities like Sunset Park, as well as the manufacturing assets uh, uh, found in uh, industrial business zones like Sunset Park, to really uh, advance this emerging industry, both in terms of distribution, uh, logistics, assembly, uh, and to some extent, uh, component manufacturing as well. And now the city should do two primary things to support this industry and take advantage of its economic potential. Uh, I want to make clear that as an environmental justice organization, we are no less concerned uh, with the reduction of our greenhouse gases emissions as we are with addressing the economic uh, inequities and crises that are underlying the climate crisis, in particular for frontline communities like Sunset Park. So first, the city can leverage its buying power to catalyze the construction of offshore wind farms uh, through some form of power purchase agreement, et cetera. But second, the city can prioritize offshore wind uses at its ports and waterfront industrial sites as well, really taking advantage of the economic opportunities that it affords us. <coughs> this could drive our region away from fossil fuels that threaten our climate and at the same time blunt the forces of real estate speculation that are disrupting the culture and the economies of our communities. We again commend this committee for its support for offshore wind and encourage you to recognize and push for its full potential and impact. And I'll leave it to uh, members of this committee to see my more fleshed out remarks and written testimony. But I thank you very much for the opportunity to comment this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. As we, we do this here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Can we go next? Lisa, yes. mm -hmm. My name is Lisa DiCaprio. I am a professor of social sciences at NYU, where I teach courses on sustainability. Thank you to committee chair Costa Constantinides for your environmental initiatives and the opportunity to speak at today's hearing in support of two urban wind turbine bills and a resolution on offshore wind. The urban wind turbine bills introduced by committee chair Costa Constantinides will facilitate the realization of New York City's urban wind potential. The legal framework for both bills, including appropriate siting, 
is provided by the 2012 New York City Green Zone Amendment. Intro 50 2018 defines urban wind turbines as 100 kilowatts or less and provides several specifications such as sound level, design standards, wind speed, and access that will allow for the protection of public safety in the operation of urban wind turbines. For example, the wind turbines, quote, shall be designed to withstand winds of up to and including 130 miles per hour, end quote. The wind assessment map mandated by Intro 48 2018 will provide small wind companies and building owners with the information required to evaluate the feasibility of urban wind projects. This urban wind turbine bill will complement Intro 609 2015, the amended version, which mandates identifying buildings appropriate for geothermal systems. The geothermal bill, also introduced by Committee Chair Constantinides, was passed by the City Council and signed into law by Mayor de Blasio on January 5, 2016. With regard to the offshore wind resolution introduced by Council Member Donovan Richards, several environmental organizations, including the Sierra Club, have advocated for offshore wind for several years in various ways, including participation in the New York Offshore Wind Alliance. As outlined in the proposed resolution, the Long Island New York City Offshore Wind Collaborative has determined the feasibility of large-scale offshore wind in the Atlantic Ocean south of Long Island. Offshore wind is crucial for realizing the Public Service Commission's 2016 Clean Energy Standard ruling that all New York State utilities must distribute 50% of their electricity from renewable sources by 2030. City Council support for Governor Cuomo's commitment to the development of 24 megawatts of offshore wind by 2030 is especially meaningful at this time for these four main reasons. One, we must highlight the environmental benefits of offshore wind and oppose the Trump administration's reversal of President Obama's moratorium on offshore drilling for oil and gas along the Atlantic and Pacific coasts. Two, the New York State Offshore Master Plan has identified several potential locations, including in Sunset Park, in the Long Island, New York City area for supply chain manufacturing, which will create new employment opportunities and could establish New York City as a hub for offshore development on the Atlantic coast. Three, by developing offshore wind farms in the Long Island, New York City area, we can create models for large-scale wind projects along the Atlantic coast, which will provide locally sourced wind power to several urban areas. And four, scaling up offshore wind will reduce its cost and facilitate technological innovations. First, we're already benefiting from the achievements of deep water wind, which developed the first wind farm in the U.S., specifically the wind farm on Block Island between Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Secondly, we will benefit from the experience of European offshore wind developers. In January 2017, Stat Oil won the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management bid for the New York wind energy area that comprises 79,350 acres and has the potential for generating one gigawatt of electricity. Stat Oil will construct wind farms with turbines that have a nameplate capacity of 10 megawatts, the largest produced currently in the industry, and uh, with integrated battery storage, which will allow for the transmission of electricity into the grid without the intermittency typically associated with solar and wind power. With these initiatives, the City Council is demonstrating its leadership in promoting renewable energy and keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Peter. So you want the microphone here? You want me to, why don't we switch? <laughs> I think I'll be fine right here. Okay. Thank you. I'm Paula Spear. I'm from Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and I'm a member of 350 Brooklyn. Uh, and I'm seeing how much work people have been doing here. We have all these exciting developments, this innovation, these turbines are quieter, they're less expensive, they're more efficient. And we have our city's Environmental Protection Committee doing all this work to look at what we need to do to meet the, the 8550 standard and and arriving at these ideas of setting up maps to identify the installation spots and making clear specifications for them. And I'm also noticing here we have such a wide array of expertise nationally, internationally. 
It was also mentioned in the section 426 for the building code on the design standards. So we're seeing uh, the use of the science that's being done in other places. And if these two initiatives are successful, we'll also have a model that can be exported to other cities to help them develop turbines. And I think that this is a good example of the kind of collaboration we need in order to combat climate change. So thank you to the, this committee and the, its advisors for showing us that we don't actually live in a cacistocracy, at least not in New York City. <laughs> Um, my co-op building, I live in one of those big, ugly brick buildings that's got about 80 families with that flat roof, is about two blocks away from the waterfront. I don't know if that means it's disqualified from the actual turbines, but it's like the structure, the, the board structure of the buildings on the waterfront. And I can see that having the maps would help us those of us residents who want our buildings to get the turbines will be helped by these maps because we can go to our board members and our building sponsors and say, we're, we're a good candidate for this, let's do it. And then we'll have Initiative 50 with its specifications that will help us do things like avoid plaguing our neighbors with shadow flicker and making sure that we don't have hazards for falling in hurricanes. And on that note, I, I was thinking a few days ago as I was contemplating coming here about all of the huge satellite dishes um, and things that actually look like the oscillator that the first speaker spoke about, the Spanish oscillator. <laughs> They're sitting at the corner on a seven-story building. They're on the parapet at the very corner of the building. There is no setback. And they, they look like they're yearning to take wing. I mean, they just want to take to the air. So I, I'm thinking if, if you get a lot of arguments about people worried about the safety of these enormous things on our rooftops in our hurricane-prone city, as it now is, you might point out to them, well, if we're all universally interested in having these satellites for our TVs, and we're willing to take the risk for that purpose, we ought to be willing to take the risk for free electricity and combating climate change. And uh, I think the biggest concern I was thinking before I came here was going to be noise. Um, the, the best source I could find was this Huffington Post blog by Brian Keane, which is actually pretty good reading. It's spelled K-E-A-N as in Nancy E. Brian, he posted it in 2011 in Huffington Post about uh, people complaining about the, the noise from from the big turbines that they had in the area. And he was pointing out that, that while the smaller ones are louder, they're about 60 decibels as opposed to 40 decibels, they're masked by the wind sound. It would be about the, like a dishwasher, I think somebody else may have mentioned. Um, and another thing that was occurring to me on my way over here was that if we're worried about noise, I would be more worried about the people who honk their horns for non-emergency reasons, just because they want to express their general discontent. I'd be more worried about that. That's the comparison to make if people make these complaints. But after listening to these contributors here today, it sounds like we don't have a problem with noise. If we work with these people who've come up with these marvelous in innovations, it's really exciting, that beautiful tree thing can't have that on my building, but we can do the, the oscillator and the drag thing. They would, they would probably fit. So um, it's really exciting. And of course, the big thing I think we're all, we all have in mind is jobs. We're going to have jobs probably from the mapping. I don't know how that works, but somebody's getting money for doing that. And we have jobs for manufacturing for these things that people will now buy because of your initiatives that you're setting up, and jobs, of course, installing them. Um, and one thing I just wanted to note, maybe everybody's thinking of this, but there have been issues with importing renewable technology into our country with the international trade agreements, which tend to bar them from coming in here because they're said to be interfering with our domestic industry. And that's something just to watch out for. Um, hopefully we can 
skirt that issue. And of course, it's fine to encourage local industry when we can, but we would like to be able to use the, this international cooperation. And one other thing is that as I was listening to this last, the, the tree device and how it's going to take care of every aspect of our lives, but one thing that had me a little bit nervous is that they want to have their emergency shutoff systems all run by the internet. And anything that we're doing like that with, with the, the emergency locking or braking, I hope that we have some kind of man, alternate manual control for those just for safety. So thank you so much for all your work and I'm very much in support of your initiative. I really want to thank all of you for your testimony today. I know that uh, we've had lots of different testimonies from lots of different folks all over the world, but I appreciate you coming here and testifying and being part of the conversation in person. Thank you. Now we're going to have Ian Johnson from Stanford University. All right, so he's, he's Skyping in? Yep. Yeah. All right. California. All right. Mr. Bronstein? Hey. Bronstein? Um, so I'm going to set up Ian Chang real quick. Thank you for having me here today. Can you, can you hear? A little louder. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Put his volume up. Mr. Bron if you can put your volume up, we think we might be able to hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Is that better? Yes. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, so um, is my uh, screen being shared with you? N not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. I'm not getting it. We're not seeing your PowerPoint. Is that better? Um, we don't see your PowerPoint. Okay. There you go. Here we are. Okay, great. Yeah, so I'll um I'll just go ahead and read my statement. Um so uh Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Ian Brownstein, and I'm a PhD candidate in mechanical engineering at Stanford University. Uh, my PhD research has focused on wind power with an emphasis on optimizing the energy output of groupings of vertical axis wind turbines. Additionally, I'm a co-founder of the Expo Energy Company, a startup seeking to develop high-performance vertical axis wind turbine technologies. Uh, many people are familiar with the traditional three-bladed turbines which dominate wind energy today. These turbines are known as horizontal axis turbines since they rotate on an axis parallel to the ground. In contrast, vertical axis turbines rotate on an axis perpendicular to the ground. Um, and images of both turbines are shown here. Um, you've seen a, a number of technologies earlier today, including some vertical axis turbines that look different than this one. Um, they come in many flavors, but the common feature is that they rotate on that vertical axis. Vertical axis wind turbines have a number of advantages for urban wind energy capture compared to the more commonly seen horizontal axis wind turbines. Due to these differences in rotor geometry, vertical axis wind turbines are omnidirectional, meaning they do not need to be turned into the wind. This means they can operate more effectively in the presence of turbulent wind conditions typical of urban environments like New York City. Additionally, vertical axis wind turbines are mechanically simpler than, simpler than horizontal axis wind turbines, reducing the potential maintenance cost of a turbine over its lifespan. One example of this simplicity is that the generator and electric components of a turbine can be installed at the base of the turbine tower, providing easier access for regular maintenance and inspections. 
Providing this ease of inspection is essential for turbines installed in rooftops where a crane may otherwise be needed to perform this maintenance. Critically, vertical axis wind turbines can extract significantly more wind per unit area of land than horizontal axis turbines. This means for a given rooftop available for wind turbine installation, a grouping of vertical axis turbines could collect at least eight times more power than a similar group of horizontal axis wind turbines. The space for wind turbine, since space for wind turbine installations in New York City is limited, this additional energy capture would go a long way increasing the effectiveness of small wind turbines installed under the proposed legislation. Regardless of the technology used, wind energy is only effective in locations where the wind resource is significant throughout the year. In a complex urban environment like New York City, this can only be assessed through detailed wind maps, like those which we collected if Introduction 48 is adapted. To demonstrate the importance of well characterizing New York City's wind resource on the cost of future energy, uh, wind energy projects, the plot below, or, uh, shown on your screen here, was adapted from the Department of Energy's 2016 Distributed Wind Energy Market Report. In the plot's color scheme, small wind turbines are defined to be less than 100 kilowatts in size, large wind turbines are defined to be greater than one megawatt in size, and mid-sized turbines um, are shown by the other color between these values. Since Introduction 50 proposes that wind turbines in New York City would be less than 100 kilowatts in size, the small turbine data are of significant interest for this conversation. This plot shows that the levelized cost of energy on its vertical axis, um, which is the cost of energy over a turbine's life cycle, including financing, installation, operation, and maintenance. Um, and this uh, value, you obviously want the cost of energy to be lower, um, so lower values are favorable. The capacity factor is on the um, horizontal axis of this plot, um, where the capacity factor is expressed as a percentage of the annual um, actual energy production um, of a turbine divided by its annual potential energy production if it were to operate continuously at its full nominal capacity. The plot demonstrates the simple but important fact that projects with less annual winds will cost exponentially more than projects with a well-characterized and significant capacity factor. Using the wind maps, which Introduction 48 would provide, a wind project's capacity factor can be accurately estimated during the project planning phase. This will allow the economic viability and potential power output of a wind project to be judged before any investment would be made in installing wind turbines. In conclusion, I'm in support of both introductions, excuse me, 48 and 50, because they are both essential for quickly deploying small wind turbines throughout New York City. Introduction 48 will ensure that any potential small wind projects in New York City operate at a low cost of energy, and Introduction 50 paves the necessary guidelines for small wind turbines to be installed in the city safe. In combination, I believe these two pieces of legislation um, allow New York City to develop the best version of any potential wind energy projects. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions uh, the committee may have. So I guess speaking to the two le pieces of legislation, are there things that you think we should improve in relation to some of the specs in, on Intro 50, things that we can do better, tighten up the language, and so on? Yeah, no, I, I think the specifications are good. Um, I'm not as familiar with the noise ratings of these turbines. Vertical axis turbines are in general uh, less noisy than horizontal axis turbines, and I think the five decibel rating um, is a very achievable metric. Um, I think in relation to uh, introduction number 48, um, it would be useful to specify the type of wind resource assessment that will be taken. For example, um, it's not clear to me if uh, anemometers, which are devices which measure wind speed, will be um, up and running throughout the year, um, or if they'll just be erected um, every fifth year for short periods of time. Um, when resource maps are most useful if they're taken over longer periods of time. So if you could have um, a select number of instruments that run throughout the five-year period, that would be extremely useful in addition to additional measurements um, every five years. And what other legislation would you think that we would need here in New York City to help promote you, the use of wind power in the city? Um, I think it would be um, additional legislation um, separate from what you listed here. Yeah, I, I mean, think, just, I think this just thinking start. through, like, what else can New York City do to make it easier for implementation from your point of view? Um, I think the, the most important thing will be having the first wind project to figure out what those problems would be. I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with the rest of New York City's building codes. Um, typically, um, those codes will limit the ability of turbines to be installed. So when you start to plan a project, late in the project planning phase, issues arise. Um, so 
I'm not familiar with New York City specifically, so I don't know if issues will come up. Um, one example is um, for the turbine foundations um, having legislation which specifies the requirements for um, what the base of the turbine has to look like would be useful, specifically on rooftops, um, since I think rooftop wind is a really promising approach for uh, wind energy um, in New York City, especially with vertical axis turbines where you can really um, juice out the amount of energy that's collected um, per unit rooftop area. All right, no, I definitely, Mr. Brown, definitely appreciate your testimony today, and thank you for Skyping in from Stanford. We much appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate thank your time. You. Claire Chandler, is she still here, or did she have to leave? She had to leave. Okay. Uh, uh, Kartik Abernath? Okay, great. If you could step forward, I apologize if I, I pronounced your name wrong. Uh, Ling Su? All right. Uh, Catherine Skopik, I think she had to leave, right? Okay. And Daniel Carpen. Yep. Thank you. Thank you to all of the, our tech support today. I appreciate all the great, great work. Thank you. All right. All right. Sir, you'd like to go first from the, on the left? Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Karthik Amarnath, and I'm here to testify on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance in support of facilitating the city's use of wind power. Founded in 1991, the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, or NIJA for short, is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. Through our efforts, member organizations coalesce around common issues that threaten the ability of low-income communities of color to thrive and coordinate campaigns designed to affect city and state policies, including energy policies that impact these communities. Because a number of NIJA member organizations come from communities overburdened by greenhouse gas emissions and co-pollutants from power plants and dirty industries clustered in their neighborhoods, our organization is a key advocate for emission reduction and renewable energy targets. Our New York City Climate Justice Agenda is a multi-year research and advocacy campaign to address the need for a co comprehensive community-based approach to community resiliency. In 2017, we released a report which analyzed Mayor de Blasio's One NYC plan and made several recommendations to strengthen the city's policies in environmental justice communities, including committing to an offshore wind power purchase agreement. We highlighted in, that in addition to its promising economic potential, wind power, particularly through large-scale offshore wind development, can have extensive environmental and health benefits in vulnerable communities who have been historically exposed to noxious pollutants generated from fossil fuel energy infrastructure. Resilient energy systems, including wind power coupled with energy storage, have the potential to displace inefficient and dirty peaker plants thus significantly reducing air pollution in environmental justice communities. The city should study, prioritize, and streamline the, de the deployment of wind power systems in the coming years. The city should also study progress made to date and strategies to reduce barriers for wind development, including technical policy and regulatory barriers. We recommend that any wind power cost benefit analyses in include economic, social, environmental, and resiliency benefits inclusive of robust equity metrics. We are confident that a cost-benefit analysis that is truly inclusive of all co-benefits would justify the procurement of wind power despite potentially high initial costs due to long-term net benefits such as the establishment of local renewable energy industries that bring sustainable jobs to the city. We also support intro 598 because requiring all city-owned buildings to be powered by green energy sources by 2050 can be an important step in catalyzing local offshore wind and renewable, renewable energy industries. In pursuit of a just transition, New York City should be leading the nation in the procurement of large-scale renewable and resilient energy technologies 
that meet ambitious emission, emission reduction targets with strong environmental justice principles and labor standards. Nija commends the New York City Council and uh, Chairperson Constantinides for holding a hearing on facilitating the use of wind power and creating an opportunity for public comment on this important strategy to increase community resiliency. A just energy policy is central to Nija's work, and we look forward to a continued collaboration with the city to mitigate the, th the threats of climate change while optimizing economic health and environmental benefits for the most burdened and climate vulnerable New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Constantinidis, thank you for holding the hearing this afternoon. My name is Ling Zhou. I'm a co-founder of United for Action, a grassroots group in New York City working to end our addiction to fossil fuel and nuclear power and advocating for the renewable energy. I'm here to express our support for Intro 48 and Intro 50. 2017 was the third hottest year on record, ranked behind 2016 and 2015, according to scientists at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This is part of the long-term warming trend. Renewable energy, such as wind and solar, is our best chance to reverse global warming and reduce harmful greenhouse gas emissions. Intro 48 introduces the creation of wind maps, which will help demonstrate wind energy generation potential in New York City, much as the creation of solar maps, which helps to demonstrate the solar energy generation potential in New York City. This bill is a step in the right direction. A group of us from United for Action visited the Sims Municipal Recycling Plant in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, about two years ago. We saw the wind turbine turning gracefully, generating electricity for the recycling plant. Even when we were standing right beneath the wind turbine, we could not hear much of any noise from the wind turbine. The only other urban wind turbine I'm aware of in New York City is the wind turbine at the Whole Foods supermarket at Gowanus in Brooklyn. The passage of Intro 48 and Intro 50 would hopefully spur the construction and development of more wind turbines more w urban wind turbines in New York City. Offshore wind is potentially the best option for delivering large-scale renewable electricity generation to New York City and Long Island. Offshore wind power will not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuel use for New York City, it will also generate jobs and stimulate local economy. With climate change and sea level rising, time is of the essence. New York City needs to begin developing offshore wind power now. We commend Governor Cuomo for committing to the development of large-scale offshore wind farm in New York. We support and urge New York City Council to pass Resolution 176, advocating for the development of large-scale offshore wind projects. Thank you. Um, next, I'm going to read for my friend Catherine Skopik, who had to leave. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, Catherine Skopik, am here today as a New Yorker, U.S. citizen, parent, and artist activist having worked with Sierra Club, Interfaith Moral Action on Climate, and the People's Climate Movement. By divine creator, science or both, it took 4.6 billion years of cosmic construction to form our planet flourishing with its rich variety of life thanks to conditions such as optimal chemical makeup of our planetary core water and position in our solar system. Yet, we could destroy it all in two decades if we continue to burn fossil fuels. The existential threat is great for life, our children, and all future generations who cannot speak for themselves and for whom I humbly speak now. Time is short to make these urgently needed major changes in our energy systems. That's why I work with and applaud all those individuals, organizations, and leaders who are dedicated to moving us forward to renewable energy such as solar, wind, geothermal, and tidal. Incidentally, in regard to tidal, I recently learned that there is a project underway at the Bay of Fundy to harness the power of their extreme changing tides. Here and in particular, I thank Costa Constantinidis, Margaret Chin, of the New York City Council for having introduced these two bills enabling wind turbines to be part of our energy mix here in New York City and for their support of the resolution to support Governor Cuomo in the development of offshore wind for New York State, helping us achieve the goal of 50% of New York State's electricity coming from renewable sources by 2030. 
I applaud educators who are preparing students and all citizens to accept and support wind turbines as a welcome part of our energy supply, helping to improve our health, protest, uh, protect the environment, and enabling, and enabling us to achieve our local and state life-saving energy goals. You may have noticed the wind turbines I painted on my dress. She did. She wore a, a dress with mm -hmm. wind turbines. This is the horizontal axis type most of us visualize when we think of wind, tur wind turbines. However, there are many designs for wind turbines. These can be installed on vertical walls of buildings, originally designed into a building or made as freestanding structures, combined with solar and placed in parking lots to serve as electric vehicle chargers. In 2012, I attended the 20th anniversary of the first United Nations Global Climate Conference in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The UN Global Climate Conference in Lima, Peru, 2014, and at COP21, Global Climate Conference in Paris, France, 2015. There, 195 countries agreed to support the Global Climate Accord with its monetary commitment to the, clean f uh, to the Green Fund and its climate commitment to keep our global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius or less. Nationwide, it is our local and state leadership on climate actions that are eff effectively keeping us in the Paris Accord, despite federal withdrawal and lack of leadership. This is a global reason for supporting our New York City Council members in this significant legislation, and I applaud you all. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. You'll please give Catherine my best. I will. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Carpin. Uh, my name is Daniel Carpin. I reside at 3 Harbor Hill Drive, Huntington, New York. I'm a professional engineer. My comments are very brief on introduction number 96, uh, on this page 21, line 21, there's the word last energy efficiency report. What this bill essentially does is kick down the road uh, and delay getting energy efficiency reports prepared for cooperatives that have buildings on, on numerous tax lots, more than one tax lot. I am against this law. It does, no, it does nothing to save energy in the city of New York, only delays energy conservation work. What we really need to do is completely rewrite Local Law 87. I've given you comments. I've given you some response and your, your attorney. And when will this be done to make it far more effective? Please continue. That's my question. Uh, the, 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 it does, it does, it's not, it doesn't go that way, so. If you want to continue your testimony, if not, I, we can continue. We also, later. all I'm saying is that this law doesn't do much. Okay. I appreciate your, your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you all for testimony, for all your testimonies today. I appreciate your time and your effort to be here, and thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no other testimony to be heard, I want to thank everyone who testified today from Stanford, from Spain, <laughs> uh, from Michigan, from here in, in our own 250 Broadway, 14th floor hearing room. Thank you everyone who participated today. We look forward to working with the administration on these four bills. I again want to thank Samara Swanston, our staff attorney, uh, Nadia Johnson, our policy analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, our financial analyst. And with that, I will close this Ken hearing. Williams. Oh, Ken Williams, our intern. Yeah. Ken, thank you as well. And with that, I will close this hearing of the uh, Committee on Environmental Protection. <laughs>